Welcome to Crossroads, reporting from the intersection of research and medicine. I'm Jerry Kay. On today's report, we discuss how an international team is studying an ancient disease, leprosy. Joining me via Skype is Dr. Cressida Madigan from UCLA. Dr. Madigan, first some perspective. What is leprosy and when was it first discovered? So leprosy is a bacterial infection of the skin and nerves. Um, it's a disease of mostly just of humans, although some other animals can be infected as well. And it's a really ancient disease. The first time that it was recognized as a disease was probably in the Middle Ages when it was quite prevalent. Although there have been um, skeletons identified that are even older than the Middle Ages that contain the DNA from the leprosy bacteria. So it's much older than the Middle Ages, although we weren't really calling it leprosy until the Middle Ages. One would think that after all of these years, we would know a great deal about leprosy. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's that was one of the questions that brought me into this work, is that we don't know a lot about how leprosy works. And I thought that was surprising, too. Well, this is a really ancient disease. It's been around longer than a lot of other human diseases have. Um, but we don't understand, in particular, the nerve damage that occurs in leprosy. And the, the nerve damage that uh, leprosy patients get is unique to this infection. So there's, this is really the only bacterial infection that causes this widespread uh, demyelinating neuropathy, as it's called, which just means that it's a particular kind of nerve damage in which the nerves lose their protective insulation, which is called myelin. Why has it been so difficult to study leprosy? Yeah, so there's a lot of things about the leprosy bacteria that make it difficult to study. The first thing is that it likes cold temperatures. So uh, it likes around 30 degrees, which is actually cooler than our core body temperature. And that's cooler than the core body temperature of uh, most traditional uh, mammalian laboratory models. So like mice, rats, things like that. So we can't uh, study this disease in those traditional, traditional lab uh, animals because the bacteria won't replicate. It's too warm for them. So I understand your team has actually developed a new animal model to study leprosy. How does that work? We're studying leprosy inside of zebrafish, which are a small tropical fish that was originally from Southeast Asia. And we decided to use zebrafish to study leprosy because their core body temperature is the same temperature that leprosy needs to grow. It's around 30 degrees. And so that was one of the, the big breakthroughs with this work is that we're using uh, an animal that uh, prefers cooler temperatures to study this cool growing bacterium. And what are some of the preliminary findings using this zebrafish model? So I think one of the most interesting things about our findings is that leprosy in fish really looks a lot like leprosy in people. So when we infected the fish, we saw that they formed these complexes of immune cells called granulomas. And granulomas are something that we see in leprosy patients all the time. If you take a biopsy of the, the skin from a leprosy patient, you'll see a lot of granulomas. And we saw that in the fish too. The other thing we saw that was really exciting is that the fish responded to the infection uh, in the same way that humans did in terms of how their nerves responded. So in the zebrafish, we saw that the insulated, uh, the insulating wrapping of the nerves, the myelin, started to come off when we infected the fish nerves. And that's exactly what happened in humans who have leprosy. I'm curious if this research has wider implications beyond leprosy. I think so. And uh, again, that's one of the things about this research that I think is exciting. So the reason that this research potentially has implications beyond leprosy is that uh, the mechanism that we identified that the bacteria was using to harm the nerves, that same mechanism uh, occurs in multiple sclerosis. So what we found that was surprising is that leprosy is able to take your immune system and cause it to attack your own nerves. Um, and that's actually what happens in multiple sclerosis as well. And so we 
are considering using this model as a way to study not just leprosy, but um, the many different neurological conditions that involve your immune system attacking your nervous system. And finally, what's the most important thing for the average person to take away about this work? The reason that leprosy patients are socially stigmatized is because of the deformities that they develop, right? And those deformities happen as a consequence of the nerve damage that happens in leprosy. And we don't have any treatments or therapies to prevent or to treat or reverse that nerve damage. And so this is really a a fascinating area of biology, I think. How do we get nerve damage and how can we potentially prevent it? Um, And so I'm really hoping that this work in sort of a general way will contribute to us learning more about how the immune system and the nervous system interact and what we can do to prevent the immune system from turning against the nervous system. And I'd like to thank Dr. Cressida Madigan for giving us a peek into this international team's research effort about leprosy. You can learn more in the journal Cell. For the APGNE Foundation, I'm Jerry Kay.